Church, this is uh, the beginning of our, our Global Impact Celebration Month. Um, I know Easter was just last week. It, I know it feels like Easter right now, and, and that's all right. You probably received this little uh, uh, card as you walked in. If you didn't, uh, one of the ushers can get you one. All you got to do is raise your hand. What this has in it is this gives you an idea of the, the funding that we did on all of the different um, ministries that we are partnered with. You'll see that at the bottom of the page on one of the cards right here. And then you'll see the list in red of all the different ministries that we partner with and work with. So, and in brown, and the, some of the things that we did within those ministries other than help financially uh, them. Target Dayton is one of them. And it's, it's a blessing to be able to go down there uh, throughout the year, and then also bless them uh, financially. But uh, uh, take a moment. This card, we'd like you to keep that throughout the month because in the coming weeks, you're going to hear other ministries. They're going to be on stage with us that we support. And at the end of the month, and we, uh, it gives us a chance to pledge together uh, to, uh, to support missions throughout the local area and throughout the world and uh, and that's what we do are you okay are you having church today i am man i am i am gonna go home and take a divine nap after all this <laughs> this is over i want to start this this series out by asking a question and the question is this when was the last time you felt god nudging you to do something and the question is, did you obey? When was the last time that you felt God nudging you, and did you obey that nudging? The reason that we get nudges like that is because we were created by a God who gave us a missionary heart, a heart not to just take care of ourselves, but to take care of others. He gave us the, the two great commissions, the two statements in Scripture, Matthew and then in Acts, that we have. It's the mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, James, or Matthew 28, 19. And then also, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, finish the sentence, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And... That's Acts 1.8. This is the mission of the church. Now, missionary is not a word you're going to see in, in the Bible. It's not really in there. There's a couple of translations that use that word, but that is not the, the word that, that is meant to be used there. What, where we get the word missionary is primarily from the Apostle Paul who did missionary journeys and the other disciples. They, they were people who felt the nudge of God to go into unfamiliar places, to do unfamiliar things in the name of the Lord. They did not go because they, were moved, they weren't motivated because they were moving closer to family. They did not go because they were, they were uh, looking for better living conditions. They didn't go for financial gain. Those were not the motivators to be a missionary. They went because of something else. There was something that happened in their heart. There was, a, there was a move of their heart and they followed it down what many have called the narrow road. They have followed it down the way of suffering for the sake of other people. I have for the last 30 years talked about the discipleship process in a person's life, the spiritual formation in a person's life through a picture. And the picture is called the ocean diagram. You'll, you'll see it right there. It is, it is just a picture. I asked the Lord, um, Lord, I don't know how to make disciples. How did your son do it? And then I dug into scripture to find out. And he gave me a picture. And he gave me six stages, six Stages that represent people on their spiritual journey. 
On the first three stages, you see the person standing on the beach, testing the water, and then in kind of up waist deep. Their feet are on the bottom. Their feet are just on the bottom. In the first three stages of our spiritual development, we're sort of still in control. We can, we can step if we want to. We can take a step or we can stay where we're at. Stage four is a different stage. Stage four is a stage that we call the, when your feet come off the bottom. When suddenly you are not in control and God is in full control of your movement and what you do. And, and at this stage, the, the begins to answer the question, is there anything else to this Christian life or have I seen it all and have I heard it all? Have I? And when you come to this stage, this is kind of a somewhat gateway stage that most people yearn for in their life. They yearn to be able to say, God, take me anywhere. They yearn for it. But when that actually starts to happen, they have no idea where it's going to take them. And so they, 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 they hover at that stage. And, and, I, and when people get to this stage, I see two reactions. People are exhilarated, they are fired up, and they are also terrified. They're terrified as to what is about to happen in their life. The stories in the Bible do not tell us what will happen when we allow God to take us wherever God wants to take us. The stories don't tell us that. At the same time that they don't tell us what will actually happen to us, those stories in the scriptures woo us into deeper water. They ask us, they, they woo us, and not only do they woo us, they instruct us as to what to do when we get in deeper water. The verses today that I want to share with you are three essential behaviors of a missionary from, from James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. And these essential behaviors are the instruct, part of the instructions. Here's how to act when you get to stage four in your spiritual life and you feel yourself being, being lifted off the bottom and now you are subject to the currents wherever God wants to take you. Here's how to act. And that's what James is talking about here. So for instance, James chapter 1, verse 19, it says this, Understand this, my brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. So James declares three essential behaviors for the missionary. The person who's saying, okay, I want to I identify that I have a missionary's heart that was given to me by God. And, and so right away James says, okay, if you want to identify that, then he states three very quickly. Here they are across the screen. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. For most of us, when we hear those phrases, we look at them and say, okay, I got it. I got it. Thank you. I'll certainly keep these three in mind. I will definitely work on them. And then we get about our day. Right? But for the, but for the person whose heart has made an internal decision to follow God wherever God is going to take them, these simple instructions become essential. They quickly see, they, a person like that quickly sees that James in the next verse starts with the last behavior, the slow to get angry. And in verse 20 it says this, exp he expands on them and he says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. A person willing to follow anywhere will see that that human anger is not going to be able to get the mission of God done. 
Sometimes when, when, we, when God begins to open our eyes to all the things that are going on, we see the injustices. We see the oppression uh, in, in the world. We see the, the imbalance of everything. And it makes us angry. It makes us furious. And God is saying that kind of anger is not going to get the results God is looking for. It's not going to happen. So be slow to that kind of anger. Don't, don't, don't even court it, is what James is saying. If you want to go into the deep and make a difference in the world, don't get, ang- don't get that kind of anger going. That's not going to get you where God wants you to be. Then the missionary would see the next verse, verse 21, that James is saying. So if that anger is not going to get me where I need to go, what do I need to do to not be driven by that kind of anger? And James says this, so get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. He is saying in order to move forward, the missionary that, that you want to be, you got to get rid of the filth. You got to get rid of the crap. You got to get rid of it. And in, in all translations, most translations, it adds the word. It's not just filth. It's not just dirt. It's moral filth. It's the things that cling to us, the crap in our life that that weighs us down. Because if you get out into the deep water and you have this kind of stuff, it'll be like a ball and chain that takes you right to the bottom. And then he adds the word evil, the things that cling to us like they own us. Get rid of those things. Take time when you're in the shallow water to say, I need to get clean. I need to get rid of all of this stuff so that when God takes me into deeper water, I am, uh, I am free of it. Then we are moving toward the mission with the right heart and right mindset. But James doesn't stop there with anger. And this is the real key. He says to the would-be missionary, then humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. Because that word that vision, God has given you a word. He has given you a, a, a thing to do. You, you, it may just be a simple word. It may be a phrase. It's, it may be a direction. And when you do that, you have to humble yourself. And you have to say, I don't want to be led by those things. I want to be led by your word. And you humbly accept that word that God planted in your heart and you move forward. That's the takeaway that James wants us to see. Then James jumps back to the first one, quick to listen over there. He jumps back to this one and he says this. He writes, but don't just listen to God's word. So help me here. He says, don't don't just listen. So first he says, be quick to listen. But then he says, but don't just listen. Now remember, he's writing to people who are ready to follow him anywhere. Then he says, if you listen and don't do something about it, it's like you are looking at yourself in a mirror. And then you walk away, and as soon as you walk away, you forget what you look like. And and so when you hear the word that God gives you as you're sitting here in, 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 the, in the room or you're watching on the monitor. If you hear God say, do this. Because God doesn't give sermons. He gives words. We give sermons. He gives words. And if he says, do this, and you don't do it, you're like a man or a woman who just looked in the mirror, turned away, and forgot everything. But if you do it, then this section ends by saying this. It it gives the the nugget, just like it did with anger. James gives the nugget, and he says to the would-be missionary, look carefully into the perfect law 
and do what it says. So when you hear the word, realize that word is for you. And look perfectly into it and do what it says. And when you do that, James says, you'll be blessed. You'll, you'll sense the blessing of God. You'll experience the blessing of God. You will, you will be obeying him. Then finally, James tackles the middle one, the last one, the, the, the third behavior. The behavior of slow to speak. In verse 26, he returns to this one and he cuts to the chase with this one. He says this, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. He is nailing these three basic actions, our anger, our listening and then acting on it, and our tongues. And he says, if you claim to be religious, if you claim to be saved, but don't control your tongue, then all your religious activity is worthless, it's useless. Then James wraps this section up by saying this in verse 27. Pure religion, pure and genuine religion is about caring and it's about refusing. For James, caring was was the orphans and the widows. In, in, in James's culture, the orphans and the widows were the, were the most, the least thought about group of people. And today, that can, it can be said for today as well. There's other groups that are the least thought about. So he, so he said, pure and genuine religion is caring about those who are not thought about. And then there's one more thing. And it's refusing to be corrupted by the culture. It's, re- it's refusing to, be, uh, to go into the mission field with any other heart but a caring heart. Letting your anger go. Letting your speech trail off and your ears to tune in. I want to introduce you to a person who is daring to allow his feet to come off the the ground uh, and follow God's calling. He started a ministry called Hope Beyond the Walls, and I'd like you to uh, welcome uh, Dustin Sampson. We have a mic. We have a microphone. Oh, we put him away. Dustin, are you going to sing for us? I don't. <laughs> not, 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 not today. today. <laughs> that was that was just awesome. Okay, you, you've just um, before we talk about your ministry, you've just heard the message. You heard those three behaviors: quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. As you move into more and more. Um, involvement in this ministry that we're about to hear about. How have these three shown their importance, these three behaviors shown their importance to you? They are very crucial, um, not only in my ministry, but in our everyday lives, right? Um, This all has to do with the relationship with God, with Jesus, right? That that vertical alignment, um, being able, being aware of his word and and what he's calling you to do. Um, You know, a for example, um, you know, there's multiple times um, I'd, I'd be taking Ethan to baseball down in, in uh, downtown Dayton, and you know, we'll be passing somewhere on the highway or a restaurant, and I'll drop him off. Like, hey man, I gotta go back, man. I got a calling. I need to go head back to Wendy's, McDonald's, or I'm, I'll be underneath the highway, and I'll come back and pick you up. There's somebody who needs something. Um, 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 but yeah, and then also, even why the, the slow to speak aspect is. That's what we're called, you know. I mean, in my ministry, it's very, you know, very important to be able to, to listen and hear what those folks um, are in need of. That way, you know, you're able to assist them, get them to the proper rehabilitation program, mental health clinic, or whatever it may be. 
And, and the ministry that you are uh, being called to is a ministry to people who need uh, drug addiction uh, help and, and to go into places where they are and to help them. And, and not only that, it goes beyond that. Correct. So for people who are just have, have hit a bad, a bad place in their life and, and they need someone. And we're gonna talk about that in a second, but, you, but there's a story behind that that got you to this place. Could you share with us some of that story? Uh, most definitely. Uh, so I was born in a small town called Wheelersburg, Wheelersburg, Ohio. Um, single mother, uh, my biological father struggled with uh, um, alcoholism and addiction. Um, there was uh, also other family members on that side of the family that uh, had other uh, addictions. So it runs in my, you know, in my blood. Um, um, you know, my mom married when I think I was about five to my stepdad, which, you know, he's not my stepdad. I mean, he, this man is my father. Um, I, I would not have, um, you know, made it to the man I am, who I am today, obviously, uh, without his guidance and leadership as well. Um, so, grew up in Wheelersburg. I was a, um, um, I had a great family life. Um, you know, I was a, a, a two-time All-American. Um, in two different sports. I received a, a college scholarship in baseball, went on to play at Kent State University. Um, I played some independent professional baseball. After baseball was over with, I, um, I had my own baseball business for 20 years, a very successful um, day job in my baseball business. Um, I worked with Major League Baseball pitchers, um, um, college uh, and, the, and the youth, um, but trying to uh, carry both a, a day job and the baseball business um, was very hectic. And, one day I just took off and I went to a, a restaurant. At that point in time in my life, uh, you know, I had tons of stress, so I started drinking a lot um, uh, and uh, gambling. You know, to I used those as masks. You know, they were masking the, the pain and my stress. Uh, that's what I was going to to hide behind uh, reality. <laughs> um, so I met this man at the restaurant. He said, "Dustin, man, you look tired." He goes, "Looks like you need some energy. How about? He said, Why don't you try some of this cocaine?" So I said, "Sure, why not?" So I gave it a shot and pow, uh, you know, that's the end of it right there. Um, I ended up, you know, I was spending, you know, two, uh, over $2,000 a week just on cocaine. Um, I mean, I was going 24 seven. The guy was delivering stuff to my front door. I'd wake up, you know, or even if I slept. Um, um, so that's, that's kind of where I led off. Um, and then one day, um, you know, and my wife at the time and son came home, found me passed out, drugs all over the place, and instantly she kicked me out. My family she kind of shunned me. Um, all my friends and family didn't want anything to do with me. Um, you know, I was a liar. I was a thief. I was labeled. You know, they, they had to throw those labels on me. Um, and so I started, I was homeless. I was living underneath highways, uh, living, uh, you know, eating out of dumpsters, trash cans, um, you know, stealing food from um, restaurants. Um, I was, uh, man, I was hopeless. Um, you know, I, I, I felt that I wasn't worthy of anything. Um, I tried to commit a suicide, tried to kill myself twice. Um, obviously, somebody else had uh, bigger plans. Um, so that's kind of uh, where it ended. Um, I found myself to a, a faith-based rehabilitation program in Piketon, Ohio. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, I met the Lord. As I, as I listen to that, I, I, I realize that, you know, we're sitting here, so there's more to that story as he has developed you. And um, so tell, tell, us about, tell us about this ministry. Okay, so uh, once I got out of re, uh, rehabilitation, um, I was living in Wheelersburg, Ohio. Um, I had my own place and had a, I had a job, and I was, my job was in Chillicothe, which is kind of halfway in between Columbus um, and um, where my, my son was. So one day I was on my couch, um, and man, I was just reading the Bible, and you know, I was all in, in tune with, with the Lord, and the Holy Spirit came over me and says, Dustin, it's time, it's time to go. I'm thinking, where am I going? Um, and days later, um, you know, I, I got the calling. I died. He says, it's time to move to Tillicothe. It's where your job is. You need to get closer to your son. So I'm thinking now, man, how am I going to afford this? Because I, I was at that point in time, I was only making, I think, four or $500 a week. And um, the, uh, the hotel he called me to stay at was $600 a week. 
Oh, it wasn't weeks, weeks later, I got, a, I got a bonus. And that bonus took me to $800 a week. So I'm thinking, all right, he's still calling me. So I up and did. I mean, I sold, I got rid of everything in my apartment within weeks. Um, I said, all right, <laughs> Lord, I'm going to trust you. you know, how am I going to function off $200 a week, but I'm going to trust you. Um, so I moved to this hotel, and it wasn't within days. I'm sitting there reading the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the Holy Spirit comes over me and says, go feed my people. I'm thinking, okay. So I seen some homeless people across the street, across the street and I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw everything I have in here for the rest of the week, and I'm going to take it over, and I'm going to feed them. That's, that's what he wants me to do. So I did. Um, spent about an hour over there with him, just hanging out, feeding, you know, and then I went back to my hotel room, started reading the parable again, and then um, the Holy Spirit came over me again and said, go feed my people. And at that point in time, I realized I need to go over and give my testimony. So I was, as I was walking across the road, this young man was walking, and we kind of met up at the same spot, and um, we got to talking, gave my testimony, and he said, I just got out of jail. He goes, I want what you have. And uh, I said, I'll tell you what, let me make a phone call. I called the rehabilitation program that I had graduated from. I'd spent 11 months there. And, um, he's, and they said, we'll take him. Get him here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I asked him, I said, will you meet me here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? We'll head that way. So we did. And um, I, I took him. He spent 11 months there, graduated program. I think he's got about seven, seven years of sobriety now. Stories just keep rolling out. So what, what has God called you to do, and where do you want to take this ministry right from, from, from here on? Where, okay. is it, where is it seeming like it's going? I need an army, folks, right now, because it's just me and my family. You know, um, Throughout the years, I've developed relationships with 22 different rehabilitation programs in the state of Ohio. Um, I had a rapper reach out of Detroit, Michigan. I've done podcasts with. So I've helped people from Florida, California, Iowa, Texas. I've helped people all over the country. I've had people call me from prison. Um, it's weird getting a collect call from prison, you know? Um, <laughs> But wanting, you know, to get in a straight, go straight to rehab as soon as they get out of prison or jail. Um, so that is, that, that's where he's calling me. But he, more importantly, he's calling me here locally um, to, and that's what Hope Beyond the Walls is. That's why he brought me Hope, Hope Beyond the Walls, um, you know, since I've, we've been here four months, five months, something like that. Um, to get more um, active within our community. Um, not just here in Tip City with outreach um, events here, but with my go bags and getting um, more involved in downtown Dayton and hitting those who, um, you know, are in need. Um, so I do go bags. I do summer go bags. I, I was homeless in the winter and summer, um, so I have both experiences. Um, so in the wintertime, I do toboggans. We do gaiters. We do gloves. We do hot hands, water, um, uh, pr protein bars. Um, and I want, I'm going to incorporate flashlights because um, I remember when I was homeless up underneath, you know, I, I like to read at night because um, that way that's, that's when, you know, you, <laughs> that brain really starts going, uh, you know, um, that hamster won't stop and uh, those bad thoughts really get you. Um, summertime, um, uh, it was, was more important to me because wintertime, you know, you don't, you know, the perspiration is not as bad, so I didn't shower as often. <laughs> Um, but summertime, I do washcloths, uh, body wash, wa um, water, sunglasses, uh, sunscreen, hats. Um, yeah, like those, those type of items. So how, how does a person become part of this ministry? How do, how do they get involved? Um, well, we have, um, after service, there's going to be a sign-up list. Um, you know, I, please, I have business cards. You can reach out to me. Um, you know, and I, I want to put together a group in, an, an app in the group me. I want to put together a Hope Beyond the Walls messaging system, you know, um, because, you know, my wife and I, we have five kids between the both of us, and we're constantly, you know, um, from 15 to two years old, and the terrible twos are here. Um, <laughs> so it, life is kind of hectic, you know, with two boys in travel baseball, and we're flying, we're going all over the country with, um, you know, the Midwest with them at all times. I want to keep this going right now. You know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not hitting my goals. So I need an army. There, these people, my people, we need, we need help, man. I mean, I remember when I was on the streets and, 
And uh, the biggest thing that I hear, while I'm, you know, when I'm out there, it's when I hand out one of these go bags, it's, it's thank you. They're grateful for those, but it, most of all, it's thank you for the conversation, you know. And that's, that was the, the biggest thing with me. You get these stares from people as you're passing a gas station, you know, the judgment. And they need us Christ lovers, followers, to get out there with no judgment and show them, show them love, that we care, that somebody cares for them. I'm going to invite everybody that's listening. Um, we're, we've got to sign up next week. If you have the slide, you can put it up. Next week, after this second service, um, Dustin's going to have an information meeting, a kind of a, a gathering meeting. If, if there's something tugging on your heart and saying, I need to be a part of that, I want to invite you to come at 1145. Lunch will be provided, and uh, we will... Uh, it'll give you, it'll give Dustin a chance to go further with you and to, to make that step to let your feet come off the bottom and say, I need to be a part of, of uh, impacting lives that he's talking about. Dustin, so glad that God has brought you here and, and Heidi, your wife and your family. And uh, we just thank you. This is Dustin Sampson. Would you give him Right now, we are going to we're going to bring Jesus back to the front and center of this of this service, and I want you to prepare your heart as uh, as we open the table, the communion table. Those who are serving communion, if you would go ahead and and come to the to the stations, would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, just prepare us right now. Our emotions have been all over the place. I know mine have today. I just, just, I love you, Lord. I see you working in people's lives, and it just, it just wrecks me. It just wrecks me. And I thank you for it. And as we come before this table, prepare us to receive your body and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen.